Welcome to the pleasures of the text session. Uh, <clears throat> it's a pleasure for me to introduce Professor Penny Fielding, recent professor of English Literature and Research Director for the Department of English Literature. <coughs> Before coming to Edinburgh, she held lectureship at the University of Bristol and Trinity College, Dublin. She's been a visiting lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, a visiting research fellow at All Souls College, Oxford. And now, Penny is interested in literature of both the 18th and 19th century, with a particular emphasis on Scottish writing. She has written several books on theories of language and theories of space and place in Scotland, among them Scotland and the Fictions of Geography, 2008. She edited a collection of essays entitled Literature in Transition, the 1880s, and the, she edited also the Edinburgh Companion to Robert Louis Stevenson. And she is currently a general editor of the New Edinburgh edition of the works of Robert Louis Stevenson. The title of today's paper is Stevenson and the Pleasure of, of Cosmopolitanism. Thank you, Richard. Uh, just let me know if I'm at an inadequate <laughs> distance from the microphone. Too close? No, too far away? That's perfect. Okay. Let me start this paper with a poem that has become quite controversial. Little Indian, Sioux or Crow, little frosty Eskimo, little Turk or Japanese, oh don't you wish that you were me? You have seen the scarlet trees and the lions overseas. You have eaten ostrich eggs and turned the turtles off their legs. You have curious things to eat. I am fed on proper meat. You must dwell upon the foam uh, so it should be beyond the foam, it is beyond the foam. Uh, but I am safe and live at home. The first stanza seems to voice what we would now recognise as imperial racism, as the child speaker assumes his central position in the imperial world and offers a racial taxonomy of other peoples, little Turk or Japanese. The whole poem from Charles Gardner Verses <clears throat> is quite often taken as an example of this kind of imperialism. But in the next stanza, it seems as if the imperial child, despite his apparent assumption that colonised people would wish to change places with him, rather seems to wish that he were the foreign child. The foreign children <clears throat> are much more curious and adventurous. They are independent and seem to be having a lot more fun, while his domestic life is passive and conformist. The foreign children's life is active, full of colour and sensation, while the speaker can describe his own sensory experience only in the blandest and most conventional of terms, I am fed on proper meat. There's a kind of deadening feel to the word proper there, reinforced by the line's rigid, trochaic metre. And we heard yesterday from Richard himself about Stevenson's very, very careful uh, control of um, metre. The poem then adopts a kind of ironic cosmopolitanism as it jokes about the relation of abroad and home. The child is in a double position. On the one hand, he is expressing his complacent understanding of the world where home is the imperial centre. But on the other hand, the poem in itself demonstrates a different understanding that goes beyond the speaker's immediate awareness. The child's ignorance is undermined by the joke that the foreign children are also at home. You must dwell beyond the foam, but I am safe and live at home. They also live at home. Um, uh, their life is also a lot more attractive than his safe location. The imperialist spatial hierarchy is challenged by the cosmopolitan idea that all space is global and all positions are equally available to all. And at the same time, the, the child speaker's wistful longing, which underpins his imperial beliefs, engages the reader in an exercise of decentered or cross-cultural sympathy, initiated by the poem's ironic distance, or to use Amanda Anderson's term for the defining attitude of 19th century cosmopolitanism, detachment. The child would grow up, or in fact has already grown up, into this man. 
In John Singer Sargent's 1887 portrait of Stevenson, all the satellite positions of the cosmopolitan, the flaneur, the aesthete, the dandy, seem to co condense on the figure of Stevenson in this image. Here is the author whose final work, we're at Hermiston, or final-ish <laughs> work, would be serialised in the first issue of the international magazine Cosmopolis, alongside Henry James, Anatole France, the German dramatist Ernst von Wildenbruch, and many other transnational luminaries that we see here. It's not hard to find characters of no particular national allegiance wandering through Stevenson's novels. We've heard about uh, two of them today. For example, Prince Florizel in the New Arabian Nights volume, or better still, perhaps, Florizel's companion, Colonel Ger Geraldine, with his ability to adapt not only his face and bearing, but his voice and almost his thoughts to those of any rank, character, or nation. Well, it's a bit sorry for Geraldine. His brother gets killed, and he just has to kind of move on from it. But in order to situate Stevenson in the complex structures of 19th century cosmopo uh, cosmopolitanism, we need first to unravel some of its strands. As Stefano Evangelista has argued in a very recent book on uh, fin de siècle cosmopolitanism, the cosmopolitan ideal, uh, the citizen of the world who can live free of national restrictions and float around the world, that ideal coexists with the dominant political forces that created the political world, ca uh, capitalism and imperialism. Evangelista writes, the increasingly globally orientated capitalist economy generated more specialised and elaborate habits of consumption that provided the middle classes of industrialised nations with new international forms of sociability, behavioural codes and shared spaces. He describes a complex sphere that positions cosmopolitanism as a new freedom of thought, but also one that depends, that, that depends on the homogenised world created by imperialism and the movement of money. The very freedom of information afforded by this world would both enable the expansion of empire and introduce the ideas of liberty that led eventually to the dissolution of that empire or those empires. So capitalism, <coughs> technology and politics come together in an unstable compound. We can further dissect later 19th century cosmopolitanism uh, into different strands that, while they overlap in some areas, are distinct in others. First, here is Baudelaire's take on the artist as citizen of nowhere. Baudelaire, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this essay, is actually talking about the uh, artist Constantin Guise, uh, and who he thought was the absolute epitome of the modern world. Uh, so that's uh, some of these illustrations are taken from uh, Guise. Uh, <coughs> so uh, Baudelaire, il s'intéresse au mode en, uh, monde entier. Il veut savoir, comprendre, apprécier tout ce qui se passe à la surface de notre sphéroïde. I'm going to be very cosmopolitan. <laughs> read that out in French. This uncircumscribed claim for freedom of knowledge and experience, however, carries within it the signs of its own political compromise. The economic substructure that carried transnational, uh, the transnational uh, abstraction of cosmopolitanism around the world depended on material conditions, a fact frequently noted in 19th century critiques from Karl Marx to Georg Simmel. Um, here is Zimmel in a, a quotation that I'll come back to, arguing that the overstimulation of the senses in the modern capitalist city has a deadening effect on the individual. So this is usually translated as, in English, as the, the blasé attitude. German is blasiertheit, which I think means something a bit more internal to the subject. Yeah. The essence of the blasé attitude is a deadening of the differences between things not in the sense that they are not perceived, as by the dull, but in such a way that the meaning and value of the distinctions between things 
and thus of the things themselves are felt to be insignificant. And we should also remember that something was go else was going on uh, below the surface of notre spheroid. spheroid. It's such a great word. I wish we had that in English. <laughs> spheroid. <laughs> Uh, or so, uh, uh, the rapid expansion of telegraph cables during Stevenson's lifetime was drawing the modern world together by means of what we now call information te technology. The first successful transatlantic marine telegraph cable was laid in 1866 after some false starts. Australia became connected in 1872 with a further cable to New Zealand in 1876. I have an article, a chapter coming out about all this in... Uh, a book from the Hawaii uh, conference on Scotland and the Pacific, which I think some other people have uh, already you do. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just a little plug for that, edited by Richard Hill. At the same time, the book trade was rap rapidly expanding. Is, I'm not going to uh, go into this. I just refer you to this excellent uh, book, which explains everything for you. Uh, Alison Rukavina summarizes the changes that took place in the international book trade again during Stevenson's writing career. During the late 19th century, a combination of social, cultural, political, economic, and technological advances were transformative catalysts, not only for the international trade in English language books, but also a transnational economy. Another way in which the international book market was facilitated was the harmonizing of international copyright law at the Bern Convention of 1886, which standardized copyright laws and gave foreign authors the same protection against piracy as domestic authors in signatory countries. I may come back to that if I have time. <coughs> These commercial opportunities form one substructure for two different ways of thinking about cosmopolitanism. The international movement of commerce and throughout the second half of the 19th century, sorry, uh, throughout the second half of the 19th century, suspicion clung to the idea of cosmopolitanism that perhaps it was no more than a cover for more purely capitalist goals. Stevenson's later work, in particular, returns to the economic structures that underpin the globally expanding world. In the early Treasure Island. The middle class men who initiate the treasure hunting adventure are gentlemen of leisure, apparently unburdened by the huge capital investment that would, in practical terms, be necessary for such a voyage. But by the time of the Master of Ballantrae, we are made aware of the pressing need for money. The Master of Ballantrae is one of Stevenson's most international novels. It begins with the Jacobite Rising in Scotland in the 1740s, but during its course, it moves to follow geographically the conflicts of the Seven Years' War, mm -hmm. a war that was as much about trade as it was, at least, at least for the British, uh, as much about trade as it was about territorial conquest. To put it bluntly, the Seven Years' War was fought to keep global trade routes open. The novel's characters travel to India and to the North American border where Britain was at war with France to keep open lucrative trading opportunities. The Master of Ballantrae is saturated with financial need. The family is struggling financially, and money is a constant topic of conversation, echoing throughout the book. James Dury is a man without any conscience. His interests are power and money. He enjoys sensual and aesthetic pleasures, but in the eyes of McKellar, he appreciates them only in the most superficial way. On their journey together to America, uh, McKellar uh, tries to persuade James to read the Bible. James is rather weirdly reading Clarissa. I think that's an interesting example of books, the transnational trade in books. There were books going with James and McKellar from Britain to America, as of course they were doing all the time. Uh, uh, James's reaction is not what uh, McKellar hopes, the reaction to the Bible. He tasted the merits of the world like the connoisseur he was, and, sometime, and would sometimes take it from my hand, the Bible, turn the leaves over like a man that knew his way, but it was singular how little he applied his reading to himself. It passed high above his head like summer thunder. James is a connoisseur of literature, then, whose reading pleasures are sensory and uh, a form of tasting. 
He has no loyalty to any individual nation or political cause. He is not tied to any location. And in this sense, then, he is a citizen of the world, the ultimate cosmopolitan. But Stevenson makes it clear that James's international citizenship is in fact a form of economic exploitation of the globalised world. Everywhere he goes mirrors not only the geography of the Seven Years' War, but also its economic opportunities. Here he uh, summarises his career to give us a version of the historical novel that tracks history through its thousand openings, not for cosmopolitan experience, but for economic advancement. That fool, Prince Charlie, mismanaged a most promising affair. There fell my first fortune. In Paris, I had my foot once more high upon the ladder. That time it was an accident. A letter came to the wrong hand and I was bare again. A third time, my uh, sorry, a third time I found my opportunity. I built up a place for myself in India with infinite patience. And then Clive came and my Raja was swallowed up. Robert Clive had a private army <laughs> to uh, enforce British trading rights in, uh, in uh, India. I know the world as few men know it when they come to die. Court and camp, the east and the west, I know where to go. I see a thousand openings. The freedom and the detachment that Amanda Anderson has identified as a characteristic of Victorian cosmopolitanism are here stripped of any idealism and their fin financial motives are revealed. But I want to end with the novel that most keenly interrogates the limits of late 19th century cosmopolitan, and that is The Wrecker. We've already had a fantastic paper on The Wrecker, and actually I don't really have a lot to add. <laughs> you will see the same uh, points coming back that Audrey made in her terrific paper yesterday. The Wrecker reminds us that cosmopolitanism is not just an abstract opposition to nationalism, but a feeling or an alignment of the individual to the world. To return to Baudelaire, it is a form of sensibility or res receptivity to the local impressions that are simultaneously drawn into a universalist position the con on the condition that all local experiences are equally available to everyone. Or to use the subject of our conference, it is a pleasure. We usually think of late, uh, late 19th century cosmopolitanism in the metropolis, London or Paris. Cities are the site in which the universal could be given a specific locale. The polis, try, uh, polis tries the, uh, ties the cosmopolitan to the metropolitan because the city is a global meeting point, simultaneously a highly charged space of, uh, of immediate experience but, uh, and the place in which the heterogeneous and the individual form a prism for the universal. The wrecker <coughs> is full of movement across the globe. Stevenson takes his protagonist, Luden Dodd, from his native Michigan to variously California, Scotland, France, Midway Island, and Hawaii. Other characters travel to Australia. This map is kind of color-coded. The blue is Dodd, um, orange is uh, Carthy. Um, uh, the wrecker uh, and an epilogue uh, imanage, uh, imagines a destination in Persia. The wrecker shuttles between cities, San Francisco, Paris, Edinburgh, Sydney, cities that were imperial centres or secondary locations that profited from imperial wealth. But the city itself, traditionally the scene of cosmopolitan life, seems unable to function as it should. Anywhere seems available as the synecdoche of the city, and uh, Dodd speaks of the metropolitan island of Hawaii. In a way that is both the epitome of cosmopolitanism, all uh, places are equally available to everybody, all experiences, but also a satire on the idea of the, the metropolis as cosmopolitan centre. Early in this restlessly transnational novel, we see a street scene in San Francisco, and this is the one that uh, Audrey was speaking about. I could actually just give the whole paper on this quotation. Chinatown, by a thousand eccentricities, drew me and held me. I could never have enough of its ambiguous interracial atmosphere as of a vitalised museum. Never wonder enough at its outlandish, necromantic-looking vegetables 
set forth to sell in commonplace American shop windows, its temple doors open and the scent of a joystick streaming forth on the American air, its kites of oriental fashion hanging fouled in western telegraph wires, its flights of paper prayers which the trade wind hunts and dissipates along western gutters. This is a complex scene that brings together different spaces and different ideas. It seems to be out of time. It is a vitalised museum, a kind of zombie museum, as if the dead objects have been brought back to life. This is underscored by the idea of necromantic vegetables, an absurd image of the vegetables offered for sale as a way of communicating with the dead. Worlds and times are colliding. A disordered geographic heterogeneity mixes disparate places with competing technologies and motion as a Chinese kite becomes entangled with the Western telegraph wires. We are reminded that the rapid expansion of telegraph cables during Stevenson's lifetime was drawing the modern world together by means of what we would now call information technology. And the whole picture seems to have been blown there uh, by the forces of global capitalism that gave the trade winds their name. Luden Dodd, the narrator, is also an artist who studies art in America and then moves to Paris. At first glance, he seems exactly the kind of rootless cosmopolitanism to flourish in this transnational scene, and he himself identifies as a cosmopolitan from the start of the novel. I was one of those cosmopolitan Americans who accept the world, whether at home or abroad, as they find it, and whose favourite part is that of the spectator. But Stevenson ruthlessly undermines the commercial foundation of this claim to liberal internationalism. Luden is sent to Par Paris, the geographical epitome of 19th century cosmopolitan liberalism, but only because his father sees it as a good financial investment. The novel repeatedly emphasises that the ideal life of the artist is a fantasy. In Paris, Luden has episodes of the kind of sensory overload that Georg Simmel was to identify in the metropolitan city. In this next quotation, the, intellect, the intellectual inquiry that should be the, uh, the position of the cosmopolitanism is bundled with Luden's fall into decadence. It was smoking hot. Paris glittered with that superficial brilliancy which is so agreeable to the man in high spirits. In moods of dejection so depressing, the wine, seem to have a lot of wine going on in this conference, the wine sang in my ears, it danced and brightened in my eyes. The pictures that we saw that afternoon as we spread, sped briskly and loquaciously through all the immortal galleries appeared to me upon retrospect the loveliest of all, the comments we exchanged to have touched the highest mark of criticism grave or gay. So drinking, intellectual inquiry and art all equally the same thing. This is a world in which cosmopolitanism itself is impossible to attain. It's the same kind of confused heterogeneity that we saw in the San Francisco street scene. Dodd seems to oscillate between ironic detachment and a dizzying submersion in sensory impressions that tips aestheticism into decadence. And as the novel becomes increasingly international, violence itself, the answer to the mystery that drives the novel, uh, becomes the centre of uh, its attention. So to finish where we started, perhaps the only true cosmopolitanism is the delicate balance between the voice of the child speaker and the adult poet of foreign children, a poem that recognises not only the, the naive assumptions of the imperialist, but also the difficulty of being truly a truly enlightened citizen of nowhere, the subject who is at home, to use another idea from Baudelaire, everywhere and nowhere. The poem reminds us that you cannot be a citizen of nowhere without also being a citizen of somewhere, and that to be at home is always to occupy an ironic relation to the world.